a nap, but I I will disturb it. Uh, I we will do uh, our best to disturb that uh, and let it uncomfortable for both your uh, cognitive equilibrium. We will disturb both your nap uh, then uh, your uh, cognitive equilibrium. Uh, good evening, everyone, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen here in this room and uh, online. I'm Samia Khalifa. I'm a researcher and teacher from La Manuba University. I'm very, very, very happy to be here. Um, I'm a member of both um, organizing and uh, scientific committees. Um, and I think that it's uh, the, the first walk um, on a long, long uh, way that we began a uh, couple months, a few months ago, to um, let uh, emerge uh, a new generation of um, a research force for tomorrow and uh, for today. So, um, even 70 years, more than 70 years before the Declaration of Human Rights, uh, and the uni we are discussing and debating about uh, universality of uh, uh, human rights, we are talking about borders uh, in in a realistic uh, in a real uh, condition uh, of virtual space and no limit of borders and new uh, globalizing um, globalized world. Uh, we are still talking about borders, about limits, about rights. And we are debating about human rights because mobility, the freedom of mobility, isn't it uh, a, a, a human universal right? Yeah, yeah. It should yeah. be. It should be. So um, I'm, um, I will present you. Uh, I will be the 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 bad girl after Mimoon because I will don't didn't give you enough time uh, then uh, it's injustice it's our condition human condition so um, uh, um, please take um, at more 20 minutes to present your papers right, and after that we will debate um, in with the, 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 our colleagues for 10 minutes. And uh, less you, you will take um, uh, time to present your papers and research, more uh, time you will have for discussion. And uh, that will be the, the interesting uh, way um, to achieve uh, the, 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 the objectives of this, um, uh, this uh, round table and uh, this meeting. Um, since this morning, we you you listened to uh, our Tunisian English speaking lioness, and you will discover with me the turtle. So please, I apologize for my English, and please uh, don't. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I will do my best. I promise it will be it will be better next year. <laughs> So our far, first speaker will be Mr. Ming Shu Wang, a senior lecturer from the University of Glasgow. Um, he uses uh, geographic information science methods and big data analytics to study urban systems and their regional growth. He explores cities through people's perspectives, linking urban structure to performance on a macro scale and invest, uh, investigating human mobility in relation to the built environment on a micro scale. Um, it's very interesting, this both scales uh, approach. Um, and um, your presentations uh, is uh, entitled Regional Integration in the Horn of Africa through the lens of intercity connectivity. Please uh, take a place. Okay. Thank you.
years. It's my first time to Africa, the continent of Africa. It's my first time to Tunisia. I'm very excited about to share my research experience and hopefully that I can create some synergetic effect with all of you to see how my work can be used or can be or we collaboratively co-produce something in the future. So the title of my research is about regional integration in the whole of Africa. I'm doing that from an intercity connectivity perspective. Before I dive into the topic, so a little bit of background of myself, my field, I frame it as geospatial data science. There are three pillars of my study. One is geospatial data, no matter it is remote sensing data or GIS layer, or kind of the user generated contents. As long as there is geographical element, I consider them as geographical data. The second pillar is called computational methods. I use the classical regression methods in combination of machine learning type of the methods. And the last one is my application domain. It's all about cities. It's about urban geography, urban planning, and urban management. To be more specifically, I put people as the most important element in all my research agenda. As the chair just introduced, that I divided my work into two kind of interconnected things based on the scales. So at a larger scale, I'm looking more at the urban spatial structure from people's perspective and relate that to urban performance indicators. At the micro scale, I'm trying to connect the relationship between built environment and collective human behaviors in terms of the innovation, entrepreneurship, organization, and mobility. And for the topic of today, I'm going to talk about the region of Horn of Africa. So um, this is why I'm interested in this. Um, this is kind of one of the most rapid urbanizing part of the world. And it is geographically speaking, this is the fourth largest peninsula in the world. And this is the first reason why I want to study the Horn of Africa. The second reason is kind of this is a challenging topic, and I love to kind of take challenges. Um, this is one of the least research region in general, and in one of the least research region in urban studies in particular. Part of the reason is that this is a data poor region. We do not have a lot of locally curated data. So what we have to do is we use some statistic analysis to make use of the globally available data to hopefully that we can inform some of the information of that. Um, in terms of the policy relevance, so the um, from two decades ago that the World Bank's policy paradigm has shifted to frame the urban challenges in a broader context of the kind of the social development and economic development and the regional um, evolutions. And one of the key messages here is from World Bank's perspective, they want to position cities at, in the center of the network of cities so that collectively it becomes as part of their regional integration agendas. And regionally, what happened is in 2019, the five countries within the whole of Africa region, they formulate this whole of Africa initiative. And with the, one of those common goals is to get a partnership of the regional um, countries and to address some cross-cutting development challenges of the whole region. Therefore, there are three objectives of this study. So first one is empirically that we want to kind of benchmark or provide a baseline for the current level of regional integration in the region. And the second one is methodologically, we want to promote this network analytical framework and hopefully the framework can be adopted or adapted to different regions around the world. And specifically, that we, in this study, we measure and interpret 
the precision, the topological precision of cities in their transport network. By transport network, we are combining the information about the road transport, um, kind of the train transport, and also the flight transport. But in the future, this highly likelihood or possibility, we can expand the kind of the transport network into maybe the flows of idea, flows of kind of the knowledge, and flows of international trade, etc. Okay, so again, so this is kind of the empirical objective. It's what we want to contribute empirically to this one of the least research region of the world. And methodologically, um, we want to kind of um, find a way as a proof of concept to see if in a region that is lack of comparable and up-to-date urban data, can we overcome at least part of that by using the combination of different emerging geospatial data sources? And policy-wise, we want to provide a baseline against which the impacts of future interventions aim at enhancing the connectivity or regional integration so that follow-up policy analysis can be used. Okay, so um, the conceptual framework that we draw the literature from the following field. The first one is about the broader impact about transport infrastructure provision on the social economic process. And there are a lot of theory and literature in transport geography or transport oriented development, which highlight the importance of transport infrastructure. So it is not only about transport, um, it is also about the kind of a critical transport infrastructure can be used um, as a potential impact to the development of cities and the welfare of the population. And many existing transport expansion or in improvement projects, they are justified because their ability to promote the social economic development um, in the kind of very broader sense. And then the second part of the literature we relate and connect with the urban connectivity. And again, the connectivity, the concept of connectivity, we argue is beyond the scope of transport provision. Um, in the whole literature of the urban and regional studies, um, there is a term called the city network externalities. Um, that put it simply, it is just, it argues there are a lot of benefits associated with the, with the connection of cities. Just because cities are connected, there are a lot of the kind of associated positive externalities will come out of it. And the third one is about the literature on the whole of African cities. We did a literature search and the, we realized that from the, a number of the qualitative oriented studies, ethnographical studies, archival studies, um, people kind of, there's kind of a consensus about there's the cities in the region are highly unequally connected in the transport network, especially the connections between the capital cities of the country are relatively good, but the rest of them are not getting there. Okay, so these are the three kind of strands of literatures from the theoretical conceptual perspective we want to relate it from. And the analytical framework, we take us three steps at analytical framework. The first one is the selection of cities. The second one is the construction of the network the third one is a network analysis. Um, the first one is to select the cities. Um, we face a lot of challenges because there is not a universally accepted definition of what is a city. There is a constant debate about what is a city by different organizations, by different kind of countries. They have own different definition of the cities. Um, just in terms of the, for the sake of consistency, we just adopted the degree of urbanization's definition to define the cities. 
and the data is coming from the global human satellite settlement layer. This is a joint effort by the EU and this is freely available for download and this globally coverage. And based on the kind of the UN's concept, we take the more conservative definition that the cities are identified as continuously sets of the grid. That's at the density of at least 1,500 people per, per kind of uh, square kilometers and the collectively the cluster of the human settlements has to be at least 50,000 people. Um, by using that the definition, we successfully identify 84 cities in the region. Um, however, that's the, we find that it's uh, highly skewed. Um, there's no, not sufficient number of the cities from Djibouti and the Eritrea. So we manually add a number of them just to make sure they are relatively balanced, uh, relatively balanced um, represented. And as mentioned that the, we combine the network of the road network, train network, and also the flight network together to have a composite index of their connectivity. So for the road network um, connectivity, we basically um, measure the driving time and the distance for the fastest route given by the Google map. And luckily that Google maps has a presence in all those countries. And the Google Maps API is free for kind of for user. So this part is kind of replicable. And then it's, we don't know how hard for the activity of a border crossing. So we arbitrarily add 20 minutes penalty for all the international connections that if that trip has to cross the border just to account for the time loss at the border crossing. We tried 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 40 minutes, one hour and 1.5 hours and two hours. And those, all those scenarios, they show the consistent result. However, just to be honest, we didn't know the reality that just how much time it would spend for each time to cross each border. We just give a universal penalty to um, kind of to penalize the time lost but there's room for refinement in the future. And for that, we use the spatial interaction approach for the road network um, connectivity. Basically, it's a gravity model, and it takes account of this relatively size of two cities, and it also takes uh, into consideration about the distance of two cities, and also the travel time uh, delineated before by the two cities. So we got the uh, road connectivity out. And then the next one is about the train connectivity. We basically measure uh, the number of the trains, weekly trains, um, kind of information, drawing from the National Railway Enterprise website for the five countries. And, and then so, and we take some kind of the logarithm of that just to make sure that there's no, um, anonymized um, influence for the anomalies. And for the similar token, that we also measure the num number of weekly direct flights derived from the Google search. And we cross-reference that with sky scanners, trip kind of the um, price lines and bookings just to make sure the consistency of the information we get. And by the similar flavor that we use the similar formula to get the flight connectivity. And this is how we, um, the results look like. So we have the road connectivity, train connectivity, and the flight connectivity. But in the end, we want to have a composite index to show the overall connectivity level. So we stretch the standardized network so that the we have a kind of continuous variable from zero as the minimum connectivity uh, towards one as the maximum connectivity so that the value across the different links can be compared. 
um, in the end, we calculate the average conductivity by reviewing some literature. We realize that in the whole of African region, people do use the road network more often than the train, than the flight, and then the train. So we give more weight to the road network connectivity. And then we got in the left panel, uh, we got this fully connected average network. However, this is too busy and the, it's, it didn't tell us so much of the information. So we use the network science techniques to kind of get the predominant information from that. If you look at the right, the right panel, the figure, the left one and the right one, they have a correlation coefficient of 0.91, which indicates that mathematically or, or statistically, they are highly similar. However, the right one is only 60% of the link of that. Put it differently, with only 60% of the link, we can, at least from the statistic and mathematical perspective, we can get the major features of the regional connectivity in this region. Four okay, okay, thank you. So, and on top of that, we calculate the eigenvector centrality um, and also the Bruttonian centrality. The eigenvector centrality here means that the, it highlights the nodes, the cities with more strategic importance in the system. With the Bruttonian centrality, and that the cities pick up by the kind of as a bridge by those kind of the pathway of the cities that through that link, the different cities can be connected. Here's a quickly result that we worked through. That first we calculate the 10 strongest connection in the region, and it's not unexpectedly. So all those are international, means that it's kind of, it's more a national scape of the city connectivity. It's international uh, rather than the international connectivity. We also have the 10 strongest connection of the international connections. Those are featured by the cities uh, with multiple modes of transportation and with the capital cities um, within the region. And we also highlight that 10 international connections with the shortest distance. However, there's literally no connectivity. Most are the border lines between the Ethiopia, Djibouti, and the Eritrea. And then we take the average of the connectivity at the country level. We find out that indeed the intra-country connectivity is 29 times higher than the inter-country connectivity. Again, this reinforces the national scape, um, the national connectivity scape within the four, the five countries. And then for the um, centrality, for the eigenvector centralities, that highlights uh, both the capital cities and the cities that's in the privileged position along the major transport corridor. And the, val the low values are featured by the Somalian and Australian cities. For the between centrality, it's more even skewed, and the region predominantly by Addis Ababa and Nairobi and Ash, um, Amasha and the Mongadishu areas. So there are some policy implications. First one is the importance of the national space um, for the intercity connectivity within the region. And the second one is the thick border in the region that results in the um, peripherization of the borderland. The last one is that we reflect on the connectivities need to be understood from a multi-scalar and multimodal perspective. So a very quick summary that we benchmark uh, the position of the whole of African cities in their regional transport network. And the, we find that the intercity connectivity in the region is not as well developed as other regions. And we feel a combination of emerging geospatial data source can at least partially overcome the lack of up-to-date urban data. And there are some caveats and ways to forward. And the, so if we got the opportunity in the future, 
uh, we would like to kind of um, incorporate the functional and locational variations and also taking into consideration of the temporal dimension to see how the changing uh, uh, conditions of regional development comes um, kind of the contributes to the dialogue of inter city connectivity. Uh, lastly, but not least, that I want to um, acknowledge my collaborators for the work and for the, um, the World Bank and my university who provide the support um, through the kind of the um, work of what I present. I'm open for the questions and the ideas that um, the possibility and the potential to adapt the framework or co-develop a new framework um, to apply that to the North African region. Thank you. Thank you very much for this um, total uh, time and space total on uh, mobility and uh, connections um, in um, uh, Africa and some cities in Africa. I, I was um, listening to you, in, but um, thinking to what happened in Tunis. Uh, and cities around uh, every day uh, entering in the entry for the entry of the departure uh, every day. And I think that uh, it will be interesting to um, scheme uh, some uh, perspective of common uh, researchers with uh, Tunisian uh, researchers. So do you have some questions, remarks? And thank you, thank you for respecting time. Yes. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Uh, this, yeah. this is um, a very interesting study, in fact, um, closely related to um, issues of urbanization, connectivity, development, trade, peace, also, especially in a region characterized by a lot of conflicts and issues. My questions um, are related to methodological issues as well as issues of implication, if you may. Um, have you visited Horn of Africa? This is the first question I would like to, to ask. Um, the second is, um, don't you think there are a lot of, uh, in the methodological design of the study, a lot of um, speculations maybe, etc. So how did you deal with that particular um, issue? And um, what about the practicality, of the practicality of the application of your findings I mean, on the terrain itself in that region. And um, uh, would you please tell us if you are aware of any potential projects for uh, connecting these cities because they are closely related. They may appear to be not um, irrelevant and not related maybe to humanity, social change, crisis, etc. But they're at the heart of humanity, mobility, uh, and all of these issues. Thank you. Another question? Second question. Okay. Yes, please. Thank you for the presentation. I did enjoy listening to you. Um, my question is about uh, what methodologies or strategies will be used to um, increase the impacts of um, regional integration. And second question is, um, have you contacted with the government, NGO, or any kind of stakeholders to get their perspectives on this project as they might have some inputs as well? Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much. That's actually um, in a network, in a in about connect, it was a very good theme. Um, my question has to do with informal economies and connectivity. In other words, how does informal economy, particularly in the transportation industry, which tends to be really dominant uh, across the southern, the, the global south, how does that actually factor in such an analysis, knowing how to even get data from informal economies of transportation? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, my question is about um, replication of your study, uh, whether you consider replicating it to another area. If yes, what is it? 
And if yes, what are the things that you would do again and what are the things that you wouldn't do? I mean, in terms of methodology, and this goes um, to meet Mimun's uh, question about the methodological difficulties that you have encountered and how you uh, plan to uh, overcome them or to face them. Thank you very much. Just uh, maybe it is the last question or not. Um, um, maybe a question, of course, I, uh, I first thank you on uh, the uh, significance of um, uh, conducting a research on those areas and trying to connect them to the rest of the world. Although if, you, if we ask them directly, they would prefer not to be connected to the rest of the world rather than being connected, especially in a world where connection uh, or connectivity uh, has sometimes uh, become uh, you know, uh, troublesome or uh, problematic in the sense of creating more problems than uh, solutions. What I mean by this is um, how far uh, are those regions engaged in projects of connectivity? Because it seems that uh, those people, I mean, the people who live in those areas, sometimes they prefer not to become part of the world. Uh, I don't, uh, and of course, I mean, this could also be brought to uh, another issue related to, so you are researching something that is on the ground. There is also another level, maybe that could be later on included in the, the study, the virtual connectivity, for example, in terms of the internet or uh, social media and things like this. Uh, I, I, I can clearly see that they are, you know, uh, years away from, for, from this. If the basic needs of connectivity are not already established on the ground. What about the uh, virtual connectivity? And that's it. Thank you. So you can. Are there are there? Oh, okay. um, thank you very much for your presentation. I was thinking of Baudelaire. What in his poem, multitude et solitude, multitude and solitude, how lonely the individual, in fact, can be uh, amidst the crowds. He, there's the problem of uh, solitariness rather than solitude, because solitude does have a positive connotation. And I think we are actually undergoing the same problems now. I cannot recognize Tunis at the moment. You know, I mean, one is lost, one is lonely. Uh, means of transportation, maybe, I don't know, but you see, there is loss of ethics, a terrible loss of ethics and disintegration, and uh, it's better to, fee to live on a desert island, I think. Do you share my point of view? Merci. So, if you, uh, if you can uh, interact um, in a few minutes, um, four or five minutes with uh, the questions. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, um, the first question is about the methodological, um, one that the, yeah, and the, unfortunately I did not have any personal visits um, to those countries. So I'm very conscious about the generalizability or kind of the practical, practical applica implications for the results It's completely from a modeling perspective. And there is indeed a lot of speculations, especially in terms of how many time, how long it will take to cross border. And each border are different. Um, so we, we didn't know the information, but we thought that at least we want to pre present a benchmark for the regional kind of landscape and as an initial step for any follow up analysis. And the second part is about the how the impact of the methodology. So, um, first of all, we present the baseline. That's what is the current status of the international, uh, of the intercity connectivities of the region. And the next step is um, if World Bank or the international development organizations want to subsidize or want to invest, invest uh, in some of the road or the transport infrastructures, we can uh, make an scenario based analysis to tell them okay those are the what if scenarios if you kind of um invest um invest in this uh the transport infrastructure in this area at the most 
at ideal um, situation, what kind of the connectivity benefit you can get. And for the stakeholders engagement, so um, one of the co-author is from the World Bank, and the, it's actually, this is kind of the uh, World Bank contracted research. So um, Dr. Charles uh, Kunuka is the, in the um, African office for the World Bank. So um, he wrote the follow-up of the memoranda of the regional in, uh, economy in this case. And the third question is about the um, informal, uh, the informal economy. Uh, nowadays, kind of a lot of the taxi drivers, or they use the um, mobile apps. Also, there are lots of there are a number of scholars using the cell phone signals. Um, in the, um, I believe my former colleagues in Uganda, that they use the, the cell phone information to get the connectivity or get the how kind of the the prosperity of the informal business in different sectors that might be a way to go if we want to get a proxy of the informal um, economics. And for the replication, currently um, we did not do any replicated studies, but we, I think we laid a solid ground for that uh, because all the data we use are globally are freely um, available and all of them are at a global scale. And the other software we use, the programming, uh, we use Python, which is free and is accessible anywhere. And the question about the um, the connectivities, yeah, I I do the conceptually of connectivities. I do recognize that sometimes the borders they are the gateway. Sometimes the well, sometimes the borders they are screens to prevent the connectivity. Sometimes the borders, they are the bridge to facilitate connectivity. And sometimes the borders are just as landmark, which has more kind of cultural and social um, implications. And so um, in the, um, from, I'm a quantitative scholar. So from the quantitative perspective, um, those um, kind of things hard to be quantified um, it's beyond my expertise, so basically I don't know how to study that from a quantitative and numerical perspective. The last question, um, I believe that is uh, related to the virtual connectivity. That's indeed, and it's um, people are using kind of the Twitters, Facebooks, and Instagrams, and people in another country, they may kind of like it and kind of inter um, interact with the the, the authors of those uh, social media contents, there might be a way to, um, theoretically it's highly possible. Um, practically, mm, I don't know that the, if there's the data, I think that's more about the data availability issue um, because um, those data are owned by those commercial companies. Uh, excuse me, but we have to respect time because we have disturbed okay. the program for, for the okay. day. We but can, what, okay, then what I propose okay. is to continue discussing uh, this afternoon or tomorrow in the workshops, yeah. if you want. But I, 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 I'm, I'm very sorry. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Ming Chu. Thank you. So. Uh, uh, I call um, Ms. Zghaira Ben Hamida, uh, our second speaker. Uh, she is a contract assistant at the University of Sfax. She assigned the research on the history of navigation techniques and uh, ship building in Tunisia um, in the modern era. Uh, she still worked on the role of the Greeks and Italians in the maritime field in the 19th century and the migratory movements of the Maltese and Sicilians in the same period. So it will be a bond uh, in time and uh, in history. Uh, please, uh, Sraira, um, try to respect time. You will talk about immigrants in the maritime space of Sfax since the 19th century transformation and crisis. I'm so sorry to not to let you um, 
asking your question. I'm so sorry. If my colleagues had um, uh, their presentation, we, we can put them. Um, OK, so don't not for waste time. Thank you. Please. Uh, thanks uh, for the. Uh, thanks for the uh, occasion uh, in uh, participate uh, for the uh, workshop. Uh, my my um, participant uh, entity immigrants in the maritime space of SFAX since the um, uh, since the country uh, century transformation and crisis. Uh, SFAX from the maritime space space of SFAX is known for a long time uh, by its dynamism and uh, various activity, in particular navigation, fishing, and tra uh, trade. This is. Uh, this space was also marked uh, the route is uh, its history by invasion, uh, piracy, and uh, maritime colonization, the uh, region of uh, Sfax. Sfax, the maritime city, the city of Sfax is located on the middle coast of Tunisia, north of the Gulf of Gabis, and the broader Burj Khadija in the north, and Sakhira of the south. Its costs are uh, 235 uh, kilometers long. It consists of a number of islands, including uh, Karkna, uh, Northern Lusa, Sidi Mansour, and the peninsula of Knais, Mahras, also now as Yunga. Date of crea creation: The city of Sfax was founded in the middle of the uh, uh, middle of the 18th uh, century by the grand uh, grandfather of Ali ibn Salem al Bakri al Wa'ili by order of Prince Muhammad uh, ibn al Aghlab. Uh, what is the uh, plan of uh, Sfax? Plan uh, Sfax. Uh, this uh, um, uh, traditional uh, Medina. Or the traditional plant, uh, is um, uh, the European uh, quartz. The books of the voyage described as facts, uh, Ibn al Hawqal. لهم من صيود السمك ما يكثر ويعظم تصاد بحظائر قد زربت وعملت في الماء فتأخذ بأيسر سعي. Uh, El Bikri uh, described, uh, described uh, uh, the people of Sfax says يقصدها التجار من الأفاق بالأموال الجزيلة لابتياع المتاع والزيت uh, in the uh, 12th century, Idrisi described the fishing technique used by the Sfax. ويصاد بها السمك ما يعظم خطره ويكبر قدره وأكثر صيدهم بالذروب المنصوبة لهم في الماء الميت بذروب من الحيل. Uh, Atijani of the 14th century uh, described the reach that uh, characterized the, the maritime space of Sfax, uh, saying, ويصاد بها من السمك أنواع تفوت الأحصاء وببحرها يوجد صوف البحر الذي يعمل منه الثياب الرفيعة الملوكية وربما وجد في بحرها صدف يشتمل على لؤلئ صغير الحب ومرساها مرسى حسن ميت الماء والماء يمد به ويج ويجزر عنه The people of Sfax are additionally highly qualified in terms of navigation uh, as Hassan al-Wazan, al uh, Leon Afriqi, in the uh, 50th uh, century, Pats uh, Eid, وَمُعْظَمُ السَّفَاقْسِيِّينَ نَسَّاجُونَ وَبَحَّرُونَ وَصَيَّدُونَ يَصْطَدُونَ كَمِّيَّةً وَفِيرَةً مِنْ سَمَكٍ يُدْعَى سْبَارِسْ the, uh, uh, the south the maritime space of Sfax in part of the canal between Sicil and Tunisia. Uh, the region is part of the strait located between the coast of Sfax and Sicily, characterized by the diversity of its maritime activity and is a natural wealth. Uh, the maritime zone uh, of Sfax uh, is closed in the European coasts and the western Mediterranean. Uh, Basing. The maritime is facts uh, in uh, um, 10th uh, century, uh, 20th century, 
before uh, the maritime space of Sfax received diverse uh, waves of, con of conquerors and missionaries as flow. Uh, the first, Al Burgwatiyun, uh, tried to create a royal in Sfax in the uh, 10th century. In the um, 10th century, was uh, uh, invaded by the Hilaliyun, Al Qadimun Amin Masr. Uh, the Norman uh, invasion inv 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 of Sfax from Sicily led by King Roger uh, II uh, uh, around the, uh, the 16th uh, century, a number of uh, Marxian inv invaded the city. Uh, the city was uh, also subject to Spanish campaigning in the 16th century and uh, was uh, recovered by Khairuddin uh, at Tunzi. Before giving a figure of, uh, on this foreign presence uh, on the Tunisian coast and the coast of Sfax, is it important to mention that the city overall benefited from the agreement made between Tunisia in the 19th century and other Mediterranean cities, namely England, uh, France, uh, Spain, Malta and uh, Italy. Uh, the participation and support of uh, uh, foreigners by the governing uh, authority, uh, period of the Ahmed Bey, uh, encouraged the presence of immigration, period the Mohammed Bey, and development, developed interested in foreign elements and gave them the right to raise property, culture, freedom of religion. The uh, period Sadaq Bey, their status as uh, foreign, uh, foreigners has been uh, reinforced by a, ser uh, a series of agreements between Tunisia and a number of Mediterranean countries, in particular Italy and uh, Malta. The Treaty uh, and Alliance uh, uh, date uh, first uh, treaty uh, uh, between Tunisia and Malta, uh, beneficiary English and Maltese people. Uh, first, uh, first treaty uh, uh, Tunisia and Italy, uh, beneficiary uh, Maltese people. Uh, 30 um, treaty, uh, Tunisia and France, who, who benefit French uh, people. This uh, treaty uh, guarantees their right and uh, freedom. This uh, convention encourages immigra immigration and stability in Tunisia. Uh, from origin or arrival to Sfax by the Mediterranean Sea in the uh, um, 30th century from the interior of Tunisia and from outside Tunisia, namely Greek, Italian, as well as the other from Malta, England, and uh, France. Conclusion, conclusion, for gain presence in Tunisia in the result of successive economic, social, and political crises experienced by migrant group in Malta and Sicily, and Sicily but their long-term presence and has its uh, own influence on the Tunisian community, uh, especially the maritime community. This uh, flow of um, immigration great, uh, created social and uh, economic crises that would later on uh, develop and cause the country to, uh, to fall under the control of French colonization in the 19th century. So, uh, this photo of Maltese and Sfax, uh, date, uh, uh, date in the 19th century. Uh, Greek, Caesarian and Maltese people and Sfax. Uh, map of the Tunisian Regency. Uh, Gulf of Gabes and Malta. Uh, the the uh, uh, Rue Paris, Avenue de Paris, Medina of Sfax, and European Street of Sfax. Thanks. Uh, uh, we must have, um, we have all time for debate. Please, your questions. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm uh, interested in um, knowing whether there are any possible common um, 
uh, links between what you studied in your project and the actual um, immigration crisis that is happening maybe um, in, in Tunisia in general, but the, the, the issues happening in SFAX also. So any common traits, any common features between both uh, crises? Thank you. Second question. It's a, just a short question. Um, are you studying it from a historical perspective or from a um, geographical perspective as a maritime city uh, or from, um, I mean, a cultural perspective? I mean, can you link all these dimensions, please? Different approaches. Different, different approaches, yes, about your methodology. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any question here? On our left. Um, could you please explain a little bit more about the methodological perspective as well? As this seems quite interesting as well. Thank you. Uh, yes, here. Could you please present yourself for those who were, sure. weren't here this morning, please? Yes. I was here. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Bashar Qureshi. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And, and my question goes to Wang as well. I didn't get the chance to uh, ask you, but we can talk about it during the coffee break. So being um, in, in applied linguistics and from a linguistic perspective, I don't know if you have an idea about Maltese, but um, I, I did a project for one of my PhD lectures and um, it, it's so similar to the Tunisian dialect, but especially to the Sfaxian accent. Um, there are so many similar words. So I'm, I'm not sure if you, if it's part of your study, if it's within the scope of your research, but I find this very in interesting and relevant to the, to, to your topic. Same thing for Wang for uh, cross-border, you know, um, so so maybe I think it's also has to do with uh, pluricentrality or uh, multilingualism, because I'm, I'm working on a project, a book project on multilingualism in Africa, and, and of course Africa is very multilingual, so I think this has also contributed to the linguistic aspect. Thank you. Thank you. You open more persp new perspectives uh, to collaborate. Ah, tab and Tarjamlika. Ella Pudi, the question is that we have to meet a Yalatlein or l'impact de 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 l'interaction culturelle sur les langues et l'approche du multilinguisme. Peut-être que ça sera intéressant aussi de voir l'effet de ce la présence de cette l'enrichissement par le multilinguisme. Quatre quarante de chiffres car les travaux qu'ils ont fait précédents. Do you have more questions, remarks, suggestions? So, please, Sreira. For a uh, question, uh, Monsieur Gorg, uh, future crisis. Uh, as facts, but that the immigrants of African uh, uh, South South Africa um, for um, for Madame Akila different project uh, uh, the uh, people Malta and Italy. In, uh, uh, this is a debut project and uh, debut project. Okay. Voilà. The beginning. Oui, le beginning du projet. Euh, donc, euh, pour les. Euh, pardon, je vais parler en français. Oui, donc, oui, euh, oui, 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 o
Euh, il y a plusieurs qui ont travaillé sur euh, les immigrants ou bien les, euh, les, euh, les peuples migrants en Méditerranée. Et euh, M. Kamel Jarfel, Ostev, les Sabaknafis, et les Sabaknafis, et les Sabaknafis, et les Sabaknafis, et بطبيعة الحال في بداية القرن العشرين بداية الاستعمار الفرنسي المشاريع الثقافية اللي في علاقة بالأقليات هذه ما نعرفش صغيرة said that many research has been done focusing on Maltese immigrants in Tunisia for the 18th and the 19th century uh, but she hasn't um, more particular idea about it, um, uh, deeply uh, knowledge about it. Yes, yes. Uh, excuse me, Akila Mahasalah, and after uh, Akila, please. <laughs> That's one of the richness of multilingualism. Okay. Uh, one question is about translation. Um, if you feel uh, your points want to make in Arabic, we can try to help because the main thing here is to actually communicate and talk. So they can defame his soul with Habi Jobi Bil Arabia, and Terjmulik Hatim Muhammad Hul is defeated. My question you mentioned in your conclusion that this migration created a lot of crises. يعني هذا الهجرة خلقت مجموعة من الأزمات لكن لم تقولي لنا ما هي هذه الأزمات. Okay, لحظة. So and then and then we'll translate for you. So that's was the question. I I can do it, but you can do it also. Muhammad Salah is asking that that you you told us that migration causes uh, some crisis, uh, especially in your uh, case study, and could you tell us about uh, some of these crises? أكيد هو هذه الهجرات أو هذا التداخل بين العناصر البشرية والمجموعات المتوسطية في ضفاف تونس وسواحلها وصفاقس أحد مناطقها كان كان لي تأثير إيجابي في أنه خلق تثاقف. وفي أنه خلق جو ثقافي وتبادل ولكن كان عنده كان ليه تأثير سلبي في أنه بداية من البداية كانت دخول وعمل في المجال البحري ثم أصبح استثمار إلى أن أصبح استعمار يعني المحليين كانوا في شيئا فشيئا هم أصبحوا يعني على هامش العمل خاصة مع بداية الفترة الحضور الاستعماري وحضور الميكنة في المجال البحري أتحدث حضور الميكنة فأصبحت هناك شركات للاستغلال كما في البيبان في أقصى الساحل الجنوبي أصبحوا العمال في البيبان هما شغالون عند مؤسسي أو ديز اكسبلواتان فرنسي مالتي إيطاليا أصبح فيه نظام مفروض عليهم وأصبح فيه توحيد لجميع المهمات وأنه المحليين كانوا مقصيين من الأعمال وأنه كانت بيد كل أصحاب يعني التمويل فهذا ضرر هذا ضرر اقتصادي ثم هو اجتماعي بالتدريب صغيرة تقول أن um, this case of Saudi, this type of migration had uh, positive uh, benefits on intercultural exchange and enrichment between two cultures, but we noted in this area um, uh, some crisis uh, which uh, is created by the investment, the, the creation of entrepreneurship. Uh, in the multi side uh, and uh, local are uh, less c'est un rôle rapport de force uh, mm. Mm? less it's powerful it's... yes less powerful in front of this situation so uh, it's um, it's a little bit 
characteristics of this region and for marine expo exploitation, resource expo exploitation valuation. Do you have other remarks? Yes, please. Um, um, yeah, I just wanted to add about immigration being a source of richness, uh, but at the same time, it's a double edged weapon. And immigration, um, uh, the risk is of the local population uh, being overworked. Uh, and this is, I think, uh, what happened in the 19th century. And in fact, it's another question uh, the crisis that uh, Tunisia is living now and Sfax in particular with the immigration of sub-Saharan Africans. Do you think that there is some similarity between the two situations or is it different, especially with the economic situation in Tunisia? المشكلة القوة وتكون مشكلة عندما يكون السكان المحليون ولا الأصليون يعني توقع نوع من الاكتساح بالمهاجر وطلبت أنك أنك تقارن بين المواقع في القرن التاسع الثامن عشر والتاسع عشر بهجرة الإيطاليين والمالطيين وما يقع في أيامنا توا في الوقت الراهن بهجرة الأفارقة متاع جنوب الصحراء. هل هناك وجه المقارنة ولا هذا معناتها تكون معناتها مبحث لبحوثك القادمة يعني هي ممكن حتى تاخذ نفس المدينة في في حقبتين ومقارنة لعلاقة القوة بيناتها هو والظروف الكل. شكرا. دونك سفيقس بموقعها بقدر ما كانت مستقطبة للأقليات قدر ما اليوم تغيرت المفاهيم من حيث نوع العناصر ما عاد شعوب بحرية تحذق العمل البحري ولا شعوب صحراوية ما عاد تجي من البحر ولا تجي من الاكستريم سود ما عاد تجي في هجرات مجموعات من أجل العمل ولا تجي من أجل الاستقرار الظرفي ثم المغادر يعني سفيقس ولت أن بوان دابوي فير لوروب بعد اللي كانت هي منطقة جلب من أوروب من سيسيليا ومن مالطا دونك هنا التغير في دور المدينة وهذا أكيد باش يضفي مشاكل أخرى ودي كريز أزمات أزمات أخرى لها سو صغيرة تولد أس أبوت دي ديفرنسز بين دي 18th و 19th سنتري فلوز أوف ميغريشن دي أتراكتفنس أوف سفاكس فروم فور Uh, uh, beyond borders, uh, sea borders, uh, and actually the flows come from the south and from the Sahara, and it's not uh, sufficiently attractive uh, to establish and to live in, in it, but it's just um, a transit, a trans it's a city of transition. Um, yes. Thank you. So um, each of you will have a couple of minutes uh, more. Uh, thank you. Thank uh, Ms. Raira. Uh, Raira, please take a seat. You have a seat in here. <laughs> Our third speaker will be uh, Janina. Janina Pesinski. 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 Uh, Janina is a postdoctoral researcher at Durham University. She researches political contestations in refugee reception sites, uh, undertaken field work. Uh, a very, very actual uh, subject in Tunisia, uh, and Triesta. Uh, in Italy, Janina completed her PhD title, Acts of Passage, Making Rights Claims in the Franco-Italian Future Zone uh, in Murray University of London, funded by the Leverum um, Ulm uh, Trust. So your presentation is entitled The Tensions between Bordering and Solidarity in Lampedusa. So you will 
a question about this uh, for the both concepts, please um, uh, feel free to 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 in to um, inform us uh, about that. Yeah, thank you so much for that kind introduction and thank you to the organizers for bringing us all together for these really rich interdisciplinary conversations. And especially thank you to Skyral for taking us to SPAX because that is where we can start our journey today. Uh, if we were all to begin in SPAX, we might all get in a small boat about the size of this table made of metal open to the sky. And we'd set off from SPAX towards the northeast about 180 kilometers. And if we're lucky, in 10 or 12 hours, we would reach Lampedusa, which is a small island that is geologically African, but politically Italian. And it is closer to Tunisia than it is to Sicily or indeed to mainland Italy. And on Lampedusa, there are about 6,000 inhabitants and the primary industry is tourism. Um, last year alone, over 300,000 people visited the island as tourists. But of course, what Lampedusa is mostly known for in the news is its role in the so-called European migration crisis. And Lampedusa is a space where global and local interests intersect and illustrate the tensions between European migration policy and local priorities and practices. And so in my presentation, I'm hoping to look at how both bordering and solidarity take place in this context and how they're performed through strategic acts of visibility and invisibility. And this paper is based on six months of ethnographic fieldwork that I did in Lampedusa and actually just concluded this Saturday. So it's very preliminary and I'm very open to your input and feedback. And I conducted my fieldwork in Lampedusa and due to the privilege of my passport, I was able to arrive there by flight without a visa. And that is not the case for the more than 100,000 people who arrived by sea last year because safe and legal routes are not open to them. And furthermore, my position as a researcher makes me someone who participates in the migration industry, even as I am critiquing it. Um, so based on the ethnographic material that I gathered in Lampedusa, um, I'm looking at the, the local implications of global policies on local actions. Um, so as a note, in the field of migration studies, there's a lot of criti critical literature on terminology. And throughout my presentation, I will be using the word migrant as a political signifier, meaning someone who has struggled against borders that are created by exclusionary state policies. And this is following a conceptualization that's been put forward by uh, migration scholars Stefan Schiel and Martina Tazzioli. Um, so Lampedusa, at the confluence of these global and local migration dynamics, um, has long been portrayed as the center of a Mediterranean migration crisis, grappling with both um, the humanitarian imperative to save lives, but also the EU's increasingly strict policies to secure its borders. Um, and ex Lampedusa exemplifies the role of these constructed border regions as places where the complexities of global policy and local realities converge. Um, so present in Lampedusa, there are EU and Italian actors who are working to construct a European border regime, while simultaneously there are local actors and migrants themselves who are contesting EU migration policies through civil society actions. Um, and this paper argues that visibility and invisibility are used strategically by different actors and can become both forms of bordering and solidarity in the migration sphere. Um, so to speak a bit about the context of EU migration policy regarding um, Lampedusa, as I mentioned, it's become a sort of symbolic location of migration governance for Europe. And various policies have been tested over the years to prevent people from arriving on its shores. And the most recent of these policies was last year's EU Tunisia agreement, which includes a significant section on migration policy. Um, I won't go into all the details here because I think I don't have time, but really that, that um, agreement exemplifies how the EU fortifies its borders through externalization policies, making third countries responsible for constructing a European border outside of Europe. Um, and in order to continue to justify such policies and gain support for them, the EU needs a visible border spectacle um, that portrays a migrant invasion and constructs migrant illegality. Um, and these global policies have an influence on the local context, both here in Tunisia, where 
sub-Saharan migrants in particular are suffering the consequences of the Tunisian government's policies that are aimed at making life unlivable for them, um, but also in Lampedusa, where these migrants first reach Europe. Um, so these EU policies of exclusion have turned the Mediterranean into a deadly sea border. And last year, at least 3,129 people have been documented as dead or missing, and that's not counting all of the people that we don't know about. Um, and as it's located in the central med, um, Lampedusa is on the front lines of this. But as many people in Lampedusa recounted to me in their narrations of what's happening on their island, the island has always been a Mediterranean point of passage, first for migratory birds and fish and um, different types of plants, um, but also for humans who have passed through, humans traveling along this um, Mediterranean corridor. Um, there is uh, evidence of human presence that dates back to the Neolithic period in Lampedusa. So the current inhabitation of Lampedusa and how Lampedusa became part of Italy um, dates back to, to 1843 when it was um, colonized by the Bourbons and became part of Sicily and Sicilian colonizers were sent to Lampedusa to create a permanent inhabitants of the island. And this type of mobility continued. There were um, Lampedusans who went to Sfax, and indeed many people in Lampedusa today have a parent or grandparent who was born in Sfax. Um, there were uh, exchanges between Tunisia and Lampedusa. There were fishing vessels that worked in these waters. And so people who are now seen as migrants um, only became constructed as a problem and indeed a crisis starting in the past 30 years in Lampedusa. And this is when um, what we can define as the border spectacle began in Lampedusa. So Nicholas de Geneva um, defines the border spectacle as setting a scene in which undesirable migrants must be excluded and produced as illegalized subjects. And the border spectacle produces such migrants as illegal uh, when they cross borders. As, as, so the illegality stemming from the act of the migrant themselves rather than um, locating the illegality at its actual point of production, which is, of course, in law and policy. Um, so it's not the person itself who is illegal. They are made illegal by these laws and policies. Um, and so this state of crisis and spectacle was um, epitomized by the events of last September, when over the course of three days, there was a mass arrival of 11,000 people on this island of 6,000 inhabitants, plus all the tourists. Uh, and during this arrival in September of last year, um, the dock was, there was a queue of boats full of people who had departed from Tunisia waiting to disembark at the dock, which was already full of hundreds of people who were not being allowed out of the dock because the police were trying to contain the situation. Um, there is a center for the migrants, which has a capacity of 400. So with 11,000 people, the system completely collapsed and the migrants were everywhere looking for ways to fulfill their basic needs. And so the local administration declared a state of emergency. Politicians came from Italy and from the EU. Um, Marion Maréchal, for example, who is a French far-right politician, used this as an opportunity to launch her campaign um, for a seat in the EU parliament next year. Georgia Maloney and Ursula von der Leyen came on a joint mission to announce an EU 10-point plan for Lampedusa. Um, journalists descended en masse and published incendiary headlines about an invasion of Africans coming and taking over Italy, um, an island overwhelmed by racialized foreigners. Um, and this is all part of that production of border spectacle and crisis that constructs migrant illegality. But this isn't the reality of what was actually happening during that time um, and what happens in Lampedusa outside of these spectacularized moments of crisis. Because I would argue that this is not a crisis of migration, it is a crisis of governance. Um, and the status quo in Lampedusa, um, migration is governed in a way that is better described rather than border spectacle, um, using a different concept uh, put forward by Martina Tazzioli, that of obfuscated visibility. And by this, she means the partial but never total invisibilization of migrants' presence. And together, the uneven visibility of the state's activities for detecting migrants and not losing track of them. So Tazzioli uses this concept in the context of the Franco-Italian Alpine border um, and argues that it's evidence of the state's will not to govern too much. 
And in the way that I'm bringing the concept to Lampedusa, I would argue that the state uses obfuscated visibility as a strategy of highly developed migration management structure. So typically, um, the securitized management of migration in Lampedusa works like a well-oiled machine. Um, the Italian Coast Guard meets the boats at sea before they even reach the port. It escorts them to a separate military section of the port that is not accessible to civilians. Um, where they are disembarked and processed by a whole slew of different actors. First, there's a doctor, then there's Frontex, there's UNHCR, there's IOM, there's Save the Children. Um, there are some nuns from the local church. Um, and then they are put on buses by the Italian Red Cross and brought to a center that is in the center of the island between two hills, so it's completely invisible. Um, it's outside of the town, so it's not accessible to the local population. People cannot access the center. And once they're inside that center, they are not let out until they have been fingerprinted and registered. And then they are once again transported by bus to a separate port where they are then brought to the Italian mainland. And this whole operation takes place outside the eyes of local people and tourists. So a tourist who goes to Lampedusa will never see a migrant. And indeed, the inhabitants of Lampedusa do not see them in their daily lives. And this means that any opportunities for interaction and solidarity are also denied to people in this context. But this system of obfuscated visibility can't withstand a shock to the system like the massive arrivals that took place in September 23. Um, the Coast Guard could no longer execute orderly disembarkations. The hotspot could no longer contain people. And the system that invisibilizes migrants in this way collapsed. And such a collapse enabled moments of visible solidarity. So residents from across the island brought food and clothes to the church to distribute to the migrants. A uh, local gelateria distributed free ice cream to migrants who queued around the block. Um, and even the, um, the music that is in the streets for tourists, migrants joined in and were dancing to, to Bob Marley um, alongside tourists and residents of the island. And these forms of visibility counter the spectacularized visibility that's produced by the border spectacle of migrants as illegalized and criminalized, and rather portrays them as subjects with rights and dignity. And civil society actors alongside migrants um, try to, to promote a form of visibility that recognizes migrants as individual subjects with rights and dignity, not just when they arrive in Lampedusa as migrants, but also when they arrive in Lampedusa as corpses, which happens far too often. So there is an organization called the Solidarity Forum that works to identify the bodies that arrive in Lampedusa because too often the state does not make an effort to find out who people are and to get in touch with their families. Um, but these local residents argue that it is our duty as humans and theirs as residents of this island to um, recognize the dignity of people by naming them even in death. And so uh, it cares for the migrant tombs that are in the local cemetery. It has decorated them with ceramic tiles um, that mark them as visually distinct from the tombs of Lampedusans who are in this cemetery. Um, the tiles carry these repeating symbolic motifs that have the waves of the sea, strands of barbed wire that represent the European border regime, um, and usually a feather floating above that to symbolize sort of the idea of freedom of movement and the freedom that all people deserve to have. Um, so these are just some of the examples of how visibility and invisibility are used as strategies by different actors, both in practices of bordering, but also in practices of solidarity. And so visibility in the form of the border spectacle can be used as a way to illegalize migrants and feed a crisis narrative that justifies increasingly strict EU migration policies, but visibility can also be obfuscated to hide the migration governance system that actually produces such illegality. On the other hand, visibility can serve as a way for migrants and activists to challenge dominant narratives of illegality and crisis to assert human rights and dignity. And I'll conclude there. Thank you very much for this telling. Um, I dreamt about what you, you were saying. I visualized it at a time enlightenment, but horrible scene that you de describe uh, treat, the human being treatment and the dignity uh, and respect of a human being. Um, so um, we pass to questions.
Do you have some questions, suggestions, remarks? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Janina, for this um, um, interesting and pertinent presentation also, up-to-date one uh, as well. A very interesting topic. I have a um, couple of questions, if you may. Um, it was about to ask you whether you consider the problem that since you spent six months in Lampedusa as a borders problem, humanitarian problem, refugees problem, or mobility problem, but you answered that, you said it's a governance problem. So I would like that you elaborate more on this. And um, what do you mean by governance problem? I mean, which party are you talking about? Um, uh, Etc. And um, are there any common features with what's happening, um, the way uh, the uh, Ukrainian refugees are treated versus Lampedo refugees and uh, immigrants um, in uh, Lampedusa? Would you please also uh, reflect on that? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, actually, it rang a bell, it rang a bell, because Raymond Williams in the city and the country has spoken of the city as a metaphor, already from Thompson's uh, The Seasons. Uh, you spoke of a signifier, maybe that would have many signified. Any alternative signify? You see what I mean? Uh, as uh, my uh, a colleague now, <laughs> Uh, could you elaborate on the possible, uh, the, on the variety of signify, you know, as far as Lampedusa is concerned? Just a suggestion. Thank you very much. Um, could could you, sorry, uh, could you clarify the uh, signifiers? Uh, uh, yes. Signify. Uh, before, there was a, a consensus on the meaning of city. Okay, the word city had a, uh, we can go as far back as uh, the city in Greek, uh, the Greek age, uh, it was a place where people were supposed to be. Aristotle spoke of the zoon politikun, if you remember. Uh, people are at the service, they, there is uh, uh, faithfulness, uh, there is uh, respect, etc. The police, uh, it used to be called. And of course, the, uh, this has disintegrated. Uh, I mean, the transformation of the city instead of uh, a place where people could actually interact. It has become a site of loneliness and seclusion, and of course, uh, fragmentariness. I was, I was talking about Baudelaire, you know, a moment ago. That is to say, uh, multitude a solitude. Uh, one may be with other people, but one may feel extremely uh, solitary and lonely. So, are there any? Uh, I was going to say, signify and say, if there is no consensus. Uh, on the meaning of, you know, the word city, the, the meaning of city, then of course uh, one is baffled and perplexed. Uh, would you apply this to Lampedusa as a as a figure uh, of, uh, if you like, uh, where people are so a community? That is to say, it's no longer community, but it's something that falls apart. Thank you very much. Thank you. Another question? Yes. Hey, that was really great. Uh, thank you. I was thinking uh, about um, Elizabeth Anker's work called Ugly Freedoms, uh, although that's set in the United States, but it sort of uh, thinks of freedom not as an unalloyed good, but as something that emerges from these histories of violence that get shel you know, shelved away into um, sort of pockets where you don't see them. Um, and so I really like the way that you um, conceptualize visibility and invisibility, but uh, I was kind of led into this direction when you were talking about freedom. So could you explain a little bit more what freedom means in this context and unpack that, please? Thanks. Just your neighbor and then Akila and then you. Um, yeah, thanks for that. I also had a question on the, the visibility two kinds of visibility and kinds of invisibility. And I'm wondering if, like, if this is something you develop, is there a, you gave us the kind of visibility. Excuse me, could you? Could sorry, you, yeah. You gave us the kind the of visibility the tire. That's, that's the spectacle, the border spectacle. Is there another term that you want to use for the other kinds of visibility that are being accorded to the, um, to migrants and alive or, or dead? Is there another term that 
that you can pose against spectacle? Is there a term that's typically posed against spectacle? And, and what would that be? Akila. Uh, thank you uh, for your presentation. While you were presenting, I uh, thought of the humorous slogan that the Tunisians invented just after the revolution, Lampedusa Hurra Hurra Wutlain ala Barra. So uh, Lampedusa is free and out for the Italians. Uh, that happened with the uh, influx of, um, of immigration that took place from the Tunisian, from, from Tunisia to Lampedusa at that time because the borders were sort of uncontrolled. And my question is, if we consider what is happening there as a crisis, crisis for whom? Uh, I mean, I, I, let us see things from the two different perspectives. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm saying this because now I'm living the crisis of being, uh, of living in France. Uh, with waves of immigrants. Uh, so it's, is it crisis for the immigrants? Is it a crisis for the local people? Or is it a crisis for the country who needs to deal with governance? Okay, so is it a crisis of governance? And I, here I meet uh, Dr. Meliti's question. So crisis for whom? And um, with each crisis we have a change. Are we expecting a change? Or in, in which, I mean, in which direction could we see any change to happen. I'm sorry for being a little bit pessimistic. I mean, but that's reality. It's a crisis. Which, which crisis is it? I mean, for whom? Thank you. So a question after that to you and here, Madame Jafil. Thank you for your presentation. Um, it was really interesting. I have a few questions on the technicality of the context. Um, especially, I was wondering, as you said, that uh, Lampedusa is now uh, considered as a hub for the, migra the migration crisis. If um, people that come in Lampedusa are granted for their asylum requests directly in Lampedusa, or they, they would do it uh, afterwards in uh, Italy, in mainland Italy. And uh, if there is cases that where people are, are brought back to their country directly from Lampedusa, I know that there is some agreements between um, EU countries and and, uh, and countries from departure that they would uh, bring directly their 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 citizens back to the countries. If that was doing that was done uh, also initially in Lampedusa, and I was wondering if you had the opportunity to speak with uh, some of those people that come in Lampedusa and uh, if you, you have clues of how people are actually reaching Lampedusa because it's as you said it's it's a very small island and like you have to be somehow um, you need some coordinations on how to reach this islands and most of these people they don't have a uh, maritime background so like most likely they have either devices or they had instructions from uh, the people that uh, smuggled them. And um, I was also wondering what was the, the perception of the locals in Lampedusa uh, as this so-called crisis. If uh, I know that uh, in, in, in the long-term crisis, the, the perception for locals can uh, start from solidarity to complete repulsions. And I was wondering what was the stage. Thank you. Here. And then Mr. Je Mr. Jeffrey. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. I appreciated how you compared illegal immigration to Lampedusa to sub-Saharan immigration to Tunisia. Um, and I have a question with regards to the idea of visibility, which you focused on. So from my personal experience as a Tunisian, more visibility with regards to illegal immigration of sub-Saharan Africans to Tunisia actually resulted in more hostility and not as much solidarity, right? And so my question is, don't you think that perhaps the outcome of more visibility depends not so much on governance or governmental policies as much as it depends on other societal variables that have to do with economic status, that have to do with popular culture, that have to do with the general dominant mindset within that particular place that you are actually trying to evaluate visibility within with regards to illegal immigration? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. 
Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Monia Shwiri, Swiss University. Uh, thank you for all your presentations, actually, even for those I didn't take an opportunity to raise a question, sharing almost the thought-provoking questions and your contribution is very thought-provoking to the point it's intricate in Tunisian culture. Uh, children in Tunisia know the word Lampedusa without being acquainted with it, whether geographically or politically. But Mike. Does it mean uh, the visibility and visibility, if I can rephrase it, the said is visible, the unsaid is invisible, and when it comes to the unsaid, can it systematically entail a question of uh, taboo? Because political strategies are at the core of this issue. And once we talk about North-South, we speak of the Mediterranean, but there is still North-South. And even when you are Mediterranean, Northern Mediterranean, Southern Mediterranean, political strategies are at the heart. And then once, uh, I mean, I attend this presentation, I see that politics is at the core how can academia uh, filter instill and try to pick up what is needed to be openly because academic freedom is beyond the political strategies with thanks um thank you i i'm wondering for the acceptance of migration because in tunisia after the revolution after 2000 uh, uh, and 11 and 12 in libya the revolution in libya we um, accepted one million more than one million migrants from libya but we don't, didn't debate about uh, uh, if uh, they are surcharge or not uh, the acceptance of of migration flows is um, I'm wondering if it's uh, related to ac the acceptance of difference and the acceptance of other uh, mm -hmm. and cultures consideration or unconsideration of, of culture and even in the north and we are talking about global and uh, and um, global north and south global south actually it's uh, I don't know what it does it mean it depends uh, when we are uh, and uh, for whom uh, but um, uh, we are not talking European channels of information are not talking about the thousands of m medicines uh, which are um, w accepted to work in Europe actually but we and even in in Italy um, I heard one ministry um, uh, talking about the opportunity that migrants represent as a workforce uh, for them. So um, there is an amalgam, this, there is a confusion perhaps. Um, and even in your presentation, you to told us, uh, you speak about migration and refugees. Uh, and I think that the, the juridic posture is not the same. And uh, if my memory is good, in Tunisia, we had a project of law for uh, refugees um, since 2014, uh, depuis 2014, no? Nous avons un projet de loi pour les refugiés, which is not um, voted yet, but there is a need of um, information and um, a cross of point of views to define what is migration, what is refugee, and what is a crisis, uh, and uh, which scale of, of, of crisis. Uh, yes, please. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Uh, just, uh, I want to draw your attention to the uh, concept of norm. So what is accepted? now maybe it was not accepted 10 years ago and maybe in the future so here the uh, dichotomy or the uh, normative might maybe crisis between what is accepted and what is not so these uh, two words maybe they are overwhelmed with different uh, variations concerning culture maybe uh, conceptions perceptions political geographical etc you know and different variables. So how do you perceive uh, this, um, I mean, uh, dichotomy between what is accepted and what is not uh, in relation to the uh, crisis of norm, if you want? 
Okay, are they, are they fixed or are they fuzzy and uh, are they measurable at the same time and how uh, to link your topic to this? Thank you very much. So, Janina, you will have four minutes to, to discuss with us. <laughs> well, I will do my best. <laughs> but thank you for all of these really rich questions. Uh, benefit uh, uh, from the two minutes le left by uh, Sreiras, you know, so he did but even in four minutes, um, I will do my best, but I apologize in advance to anyone whose question I don't get to find me in the coffee break and we'll, uh, we'll continue the conversation. So I'll start with this um, elaborating on the, the governance aspect, because I think that will enable me to touch on several points. Um, and I'll start with the Ukrainian situation. Um, I, I don't have the exact figure, but I think that Italy um, welcomed about 160,000 Ukrainians. And this was not in, in a very short time span, in the span of several months. And they were able to travel to Italy using um, safe and legal routes. They were provided with support by the government. They were provided with all the legal paperwork that they need, with Italian language classes, and they were included in society. Um, so this proves that when there is political will, it is entirely possible to do this. Um, and this is why I come back to the governance problem, because to me, it is a quite deliberate choice to do that for some people and not for others. Um, so there are other ways of facilitating and governing mobility. And of course, this is the, it's, it's impossible to address without looking at the whole global scope of the problem. But if we look at the reasons that people are leaving the countries that they're born in, um, many of them can be traced back to problems that have been caused by European colonialism and the neoliberal vestiges of that that continue to be active in these countries. Um, and exploitation of both human and natural resources that continues in these countries. And then the fact that there is no structure for people in these situations to emigrate uh, safely and legally to other countries. So this is why I come back to, to it being a crisis of governance as opposed to a crisis of migration, because it is not produced by the people who are being forced to move, whether they are later acknowledged as, as legal refugees, or if they are um, considered as, as migrants as a sort of definitional legal issue um, that is also implicated in this, this governance question. Um, so, so, and of course I could <laughs> elaborate a whole separate paper on that, but I'll stop just to talk about some of the, the details of the, the situation in, in Lampedusa, because it's very much, um, it's called a hotspot, and it's used as a processing point. So people cannot claim asylum there. They are only registered and they can only make a, an asylum claim when they reach um, another location in Italy. But similarly, they aren't sent directly back from Lampedusa. It just doesn't, none of the infrastructural capacity exists to do that. That's also done from other um, places in Italy. And I think um, maybe this, I, this concept of the signifier and the contestation over you know, what Lampedusa even is anymore is also reflected by local attitudes because um, there's a huge diversity in the way that people think and speak about migration in Lampedusa, but something that everyone has told me and something that I, I saw during the, the months I spent there is that no matter what people's discourses about migration are, in reality, when they are face to face with a person who needs something, they will help. Um, so even the people who vote for um, the La Lega have been both now and in the past, have provided material assistance to migrants who have arrived in Lampedusa. So this is the, the difference sort of between practices and discourses about, about the issue there. Um, thank you for the reference and the, this idea to think more about freedom. I think when I say it, I mean um, just in a very, well, not so basic sense of freedom of movement um, as, as a basic human right. And um, I also really like this idea of thinking about uh, maybe expanding this idea of a non-spectacularized visibility and coming up with a, a way to think about that. Um, so I think lots to work through as I continue to develop the paper. So thank you so much for all your questions and input. Thank you very much. So um, question in this question of border and um, around the Mediterranean, we will continue with Bernardo Lopez Marini and um, Jean-Marie Alenti. Uh, Bernardo Lopez Malin is a postdoctoral research associate in Durham University. He was awarded a PhD in social anthropology by the Trobe University Austria, in Australia. Uh, Bernardo completed uh, a master of science 
uh, in social anthropology at the National School of Anthropology and the History in Mexico, uh, Mexico City. And uh, Jean-Marie Alenti uh, is a PhD in social anthropology from National School of Anthropology and the History uh, of Mexico City in Mexico. And both uh, will present um, the management and strength strengthening uh, of the European and border regime, uh, the case of the Italian migration, we will continue debating uh, about um, this part of the world. Um, the, so the, the case of the Italian migration crisis and invasion, uh, if we can tell, tell it, uh, um, as invasion, but for whom? And uh, that's why uh, we have uh, uh, a kind uh, um, smile when you uh, ask it for whom, Akila. So uh, you will have in total uh, uh, 35 minutes, uh, uh, thanks to the three minutes of Sreira. Uh, 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 and um, you, as you, 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 you have, you. yes, you have 30 minutes of time to tell us about it and to debate about it. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much for this kind presentation. Before uh, jumping into our topic, we would like to thank the Tunisian Academy of Science, Letters and Arts, the St. John's College, and especially Professor Mohamed Salah Omri for having coordinated this very important and timely event. We are so happy to be here. Thank you for having us over. It's such a pleasure. We also want to thank our chair, who's been so great in doing this job today, as well as all presenters and uh, also the audience who provided such useful, important and timely insights today. And uh, also thanks to Janina and Zahira particularly because they kind of made a bridge <laughs> for us because our, uh, our presentation will be a bit um, concerning both topic, like concerning the connection between Italy and Tunisia in relation to migration governments and uh, externalization policies. Um, just as well prelude, our main, uh, our co-authored paper is something new for us in this case. We usually don't work on the Italian context. We are social anthropologists who have been working for over a decade on uh, migrations and borders, mobilities, but in the cases of Mexico, Turkey and Morocco, focusing particularly on uh, migrants and refugees' experiences, emotions and subjectivities, trying to hear their stories in order to formulate critique against the way how border regimes and international agreements put their life at risk or in very precarious conditions. So, I will jump into it. Italiani brava gente, italiani dal cuore d'oro. These popular Italian idioms literally translate as Italians good people, Italians have a golden hearth. <laughs> and although this may sound presumptuously petulant and self-extolling, this notion is quite ingrained in the mainstream social and political narrative of the Republic. Our presentation addresses contemporary discourses enacted by the neo-fascist government of Georgia Meloni within the spheres of migration governments, especially in relation to its externalized dimension. These discourses have been among the hot topics the Prime Minister successfully put forward during her electoral campaign, inducing the majority of Italians to vote for the most far-right government since Mussolini's time. Understanding contemporary mobility governance by Italy requires an analysis at the intersections between political anthropology, history, international relations, public policy and communication as a framework of understanding of historical and contemporary narratives, either factual or post-factual, which legitimize the violent border politics enacted by her government and also by previous ones. From a decolonial perspective, we aim to formulate a critique of Italy's containment strategy and its role within the broader framework of the EU, which has long neglected its colonial and neocolonial role in generating migration from Africa, while continuing to perpetrate a racial apartheid which places the lives of non-white people on a fine line between life and death when they embark on migration journeys. On the one hand, 
Western hypo hypocritical discourses about democracy and freedom will be counterpointed herein by an exploration of the actual policies enacted to deter inflow from the unprivileged sides of the world, regardless of the human cost of these endeavors. On the other hand, the doubtful rhetoric creating social fears about alleged migration invasions and the European migration crisis serves to justify the precarity, suffering, and death of, of racialized people en route. But let's move a step back in time to understand Italy's role as a crossroad in the Mediterranean and frankly ask ourselves some question about who actually is the invader and who is currently experiencing a crisis in spite of the widespread denialism in both Italian politics and the local society. Let's not go as far as the Roman Empire with its capital, which was self-entitled as Caput Mundi, the head of the world, and its legacy related to the Christian church and expansionism, whose imperialist role in different shapes and contexts could also be considered as colonialism. Nevertheless, it is important to keep in mind that the ideological framework originating in the past finds resonances in today's ontological perception of the Italian identity and its citizens. Italy's unification and formal birth dates back to the 1861, when other European nations had already invaded, ravaged, submitted, and ransacked several nearby and distant regions of the planet. Through diplomatic relations with the British Empire, Italy could secure its presence in the Horn of Africa and achieve control over Eritrea and Somalia. But tensions did not take long to shake the region due to Italy's closing of sea access to Ethiopia. By the end of the 19th century, Italy suffered a major defeat, which had the effect of hitting nationalist fervors in the population, paving the way for the gradual rise of the fascist regime. Under Mussolini, colonial enterprises in the Horn of Africa saw the apex with the annexation of Libya and Ethiopia, which were discursively framed around a diversity of social political discourses. The first one, related to the alleged glory of the Italian empire, which camouflaged the redu reduced benefits of Italy's colonial work and the countless difficulties colonizers were con constantly encountering. The second one relates to the widespread myth of the Italian colonizer as a good soldier, someone who treated local population with love and respect, regardless of the inhuman practices perpetrated by them in Africa, such as summary executions, torture, and mass incarceration in Libya, the use of internationally banned master gas in Ethiopia, or the nationally encouraged practice of madamato in the war region. Madamato consisted in forcibly taking ownership of local women to fulfill soldier sexual desire, something that stopped with Mussolini because Mussolini said, no, in this way we risk our national purity. It is estimated that during the 60 years of Italian colonialism, almost 1 million people lost their lives. Even though Italy's short and not very extensive imperial experience did not produce the political, economic, and cultural windfall of other European nations, the colonialist idea that Mediterranean Sea is Mare Nostrum, our sea, and that the country had to have an influence in the region is a central pillar of today's Italian foreign policy, which is now even considering issues of internal and national security. While the era of direct colonization may be over, Italy's contemporary economic engagement in Africa reflects a continuation of exploitative practices. In fact, Italian multinational corporations have become primary instruments through which neocolonial objectives are pursued. Although this frequently implies ransacking and exporting natural resources, degrading the natural environment, displacing communities and exploiting local labor. The profits generated by these businesses rarely benefit the local population, exacerbating socioeconomic disparities and perpetuating a cycle of poverty that ultimately forces international migration. To provide a timely instance of the most mentioned arguments, it may be worth mentioning that the genocidal state of Israel has just given licenses for gas exploration in the sea area in front of occupied Gaza to the Italian energy corporation ENI, which together with Enel is very well known for the disasters it has historically made in Africa. 
In spite of Italy's dark past and present, of which we offer just a brief overview, it seems like there is an alarming lack of historical awareness, or maybe let's call it denialism, in Meloni's government and its anti-immigration counterparts in politics and society, especially when discourses about migration crisis and invasions spread around so easily and without much self-questioning. I leave the word to Bernardo. Uh, so, yeah, the sociopolitical consequences of globalization for developing countries are now visible in the effects of migration governance has had in international and local politics, affecting the quality of life for migrants and changing the nature of transit migration. Many answers for the increase in migration lie in the spheres of global power and governance, making it necessary to identify and examine the sociopolitical and sociocultural effects that global politics have on people on a journey and the consequences brought to migrants by irregularization, especially in the case of Italy and the new agreement signed with Tunisia. The effects of these politics are now evident in the increasing amount of suffering and life loss during migratory attempts to reach Europe. And it has the case, and that's the case of dozens of boats sinking in the Mediterranean nowadays. Meanwhile, the solutions proposed for Italy's migration crisis has been inconsistent, leaving migrants stuck in the Maghreb and without possibility to either continue with their journeys or come back to their countries. The new migration policies drafted by Italy tend to underestimate the adversities created in Africa by the remnants of colonialism and the continuation of capitalist ransacking throughout neocolonialism, while Europe keeps ignoring its accountability in the disappearance and deaths of migrants who are trafficked, kidnapped, enslaved, killed, deported, and drowned in the Mediterranean. The results of several reforms to Europe's immigration governance have led to the enacting of harder structural violence against unauthorized migrants, which is framing a rhetoric of human rights and justice that upholds double standards and strengthens sociopolitical iniquity, although in the name of democracy and freedom. We argue that the political measures taken by the European Union to control irregular migration have never intended to protect migrants, human rights, and neither the right to asylum, but rather it has given the priority to border regimes and migration governance in safeguarding the influence of monopolies of imperialist European governments that are more preoccupied with moving their militarized borders further south instead of detaining economic extractivism to create better conditions for potential migrants back in their own homelands. The ways in which Europe has recently managed irregularized migration and the drafting of new policies dismissing previous international conventions such as the new pact on migration and asylum, as well as the new migration deals signed by Italy with Tunisia and later with Albania, demonstrate that the newest migration government supposedly based on democracy and freedom is not necessarily inclusive, but merely a fashionable way of exercising power through the sophistication of border regimes and the abandonment of migrants. The new global order and international relations of power cynically keep on violating international conventions and human rights and their, at their convenience and for the sake of upholding privileges and interests, including electoral aims, while constructing the increase of migration as a crisis that constitutes an invasion from which Europe has to be protected in order to avoid the con the continent forcibly become black or Muslim. Europe, and especially Italy, and its neo-fascist government get away with perpetuating a crime against humanity, as shown by the limited international backlash and official criticism for the abandonment, destitution, human suffering, and deaths experienced by, th by thousands of migrants in the Maghreb and the Mediterranean Sea. We have researched for a decade on the phenomenon of unauthorized migration in various part, parts of the world. 
analyzing it from the current political relations of power and the inherent economic interest which have been imposed by the Italy, by Italy and Europe upon underdeveloped countries through colonization and more recently through globalization and also by the implementation of neoliberal politics. Although frequently coerced by the dynamics of global politics, it is within the national level where the substructures of migration governance, border regimes, and externalization agreements have practical consequences for migrants who have or get stuck in local settings, forcing them to navigate through the realms of destitution, hunger, dehumanization, and racism. Considering that Diverse in mobilities transform people on a journey, life conditions, and existence. We have identified the concept and conceptualized the sociopolitical, physical, and psychosocial effects that unauthorized migration has on these marginalized populations by examining the dialogical relationship ending the coloniality of migration governance with the social well being of irregular as migrants who are denied an equal liberty of movement and possibilities to forge a de dignified future. Furthermore, the criminalization of displaced individuals through the manipulated dissemination of political rhetoric and liberalist ways of conceiving liberty and freedom of choice works as an instrument employed by globalized power to blame people on a journey for their own misfortunes. This also condones the implementation of legislative measures to stop irregular migration that exculpate the enormous levels of human suffering and deaths along transit routes, placing the accountability on the wrong decisions taken by migrants who are seen in liberal terms as seeking their own demise and responsible for the consequences of their own sufferings at deaths due to the taking of wrong decisions. While global structures of power have been designed and implemented by the European Union and the Italian government to represent irregular migration as a threat, the changeability of migration governance does effective work in convincing its own populations that their own countries are being invaded by illegal immigrants that are coming to steal their jobs and engage in crime. At the same time, the EU and the Italian government increased their supporting of Libya and Tunisia to hinder the departure of precarious boats towards Europe, while migrants continue to be the victims of their border regime by remaining entrapped in unlivable places and taking life-threatening risk and increasing lead to deaths and disappearances in the Mediterranean Sea. The current neo-fascist Italian government is criminalizing rescue ships, while neither the EU nor Italy are doing anything to provide opportunities for people to refrain from migrating or rather remain in Africa. All these examples demonstrate that necropolitics as a political strategy forms an integral part of the newest global migration government governance, which is preoccupied with stopping the arrivals of irregularized people, but not with their upholding of safety and quality of life. This claim is evidenced by stock migrants who told us that if they had life opportunities, employment, and some sort of security, they will not immigrate or risk their lives by venturing themselves into the sea. Their stories reveal the fear and anguish migrants experience when taking about crossing the Mediterranean and make it clear that if they do that, it is because they have no other option. According to the testimonies of migrants we have registered during our anthropological work in Mexico, Morocco and Turkey, when racialized people become stuck due to institutional repression and the effects of border regimes, they face extreme difficulties and challenges, such as living off begging and endure extreme hunger, racism and being represented as slaves in some cases. They see few options to do anything with their lives due to unemployment, linguistic difficulties, religious differences and racialization. In addition, returning to their countries is not a plausible possibility for many, be simply because they fear finding similar or even worse circumstances than when they left their countries. 
Thereby, most migrants believe that the only option for a life change is risking their lives crossing the sea or putting themselves in danger by crossing borders, sometimes with the assistance of drug cartels, untrustworthy enablers or corrupted border authorities. Hence, migration governance and border regimes are now, are now placing migrants in situations in which they are currently becoming stuck and have neither choice nor opportunities in life, whether in their countries of origin or while they stay in any given safer country where living conditions are extremely hard. The normalization of human exclusion and, ex and segregation through the coloniality of migration based on the racialization of people on a journey reflects that the apartheid of migration has become the norm in recent amendments in migration governance that are based on nationality differentiation, as well as issues regarding ethnic and religious exclusion that have created a hierarchy of migrants and asylum seekers depending on their nationality, race, religion, sociocultural upbringing, such as as Janina was saying, such as the case of Ukrainian refugees who have been given a red carpet and solidarity everywhere vis-a-vis -vis the reality experienced by sub-Saharan migrants in countries like Morocco and Tunisia who struggle to survive by begging and being recognized by the coloniality of Europe's asylum system and migration system. Hence, the coloniality of Europe's migration system has produced and reproduced a set of exclusions, economies of suffering, and a conception of illegal human trafficking and smuggling by normalizing the notion of traveling through legal or illegal channels that are openly based on the privilege given to certain individuals, such as the expats, through the racialization of people which excludes those cataloged as undesirable migrants ineligible to live and work in the European Union. Uh, and just to close, well, while extolling in widespread discourses of democracy and freedom, Europe constructs a dichotomy of civilization versus barbarism, which, he, which is influential uh, on nations who claim to be the epitome of high culture and civilization, maintaining a differentiation of people through the creation of a hierarchy of inter international movement on a racializing bi basis that keeps benefiting the white, rich, and highly educated part of the world populations as desirable migrants. In the case of Italian politics and its discourses, this dichotomy of, of civilization barbarism now appears to be invert as the seemingly barbaric state of abandonment and racialization of migrants does not make justice to those liberal claims related to freedom, democracy, and human rights. Although colonialism, racial segregation, and human slavery have supposedly been abolished, our research reveals their ongoing existence and perpetuation. Italy and Europe keep on exploiting, segregating, and recolonizing the African continent through economic captivity, free market economies, the implementation of neoliberal politics, and the plundering of resources by multinational companies while creating circumstances in which most people in Africa continue continue to live in poverty and struggle to fulfill their basic needs. Meanwhile, the discourse of an invasion by undesirable migrants and underserving refugees has acquired much more credibility, and this fallacy has now become widely accepted in places like the UK, Italy, and the USA. However, all this draws into question a migration crisis that is leading to an invasion, but for whom? Invading in which manner and who are and always have been the invaders through colonialism and ransacking capitalism that have left entire continents drowning in poverty and precarity and exploitation. And to conclude, the biggest problem in the scene is not the irregular migration, facilitators and illegality, but rather an immoral and decadent economic system that has created extensive differences around the world. It continues to exploit those who have less to enrich the few and protect the global monopoly created by the European Union to control migration and maintain its position as the democratic police officer in charge of a system renowned for its injustices, racism and colonialist bloodshed. The missing link is found in the narratives of migrants and the current sociopolitical situation in most African countries, which continue to be dependent on the powerful side of the earth 
and its populations at the service of empires that have never disappeared but keep on creating scars and damage without a word of shame and condolence. Thank you. Thank you for your engaged uh, speech. Um, you question um, many, many um, concepts, uh, those of development choices, modernity, colonialism, uh, borders, the, the uh, discourse, uh, the analysis of discourse. We will have seven minutes of interaction, questions and debate, please. Um, Hi, um, that was great. Um, I was wondering whether I had two questions. One was I whether can't hear you. Uh, I had two questions. One, whether we could decenter mm -hmm. Europe in this migration regime, you know, what Chakrabarti calls sort of provincializing Europe, and then think about roles of India and China and inequalities in those countries uh, and how that informs this global migration regime that you're talking about, and particularly in Italy. Uh, if you have, uh, if you could elaborate on that, and then just thinking about how migrants in uh, European countries already are now kind of at the forefront of preventing or designing migration policies uh, that sort of stop uh, other migrants from coming. So sort of kicking away the ladder that sort of Suela Braverman in in the UK uh, is championing. Um, I wondered how that compared to the Italian context. So. Are there migrants from second and third generation now who are really the face of, of right wing implementation of um, of migration policies? Thanks. Thank you. Second question. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. This was epic. It was awesome. I loved it. Um, now um, I have a technical comment and a technical question because I'm having a hard time knowing how I feel about this. You know, as a normal person, this was amazing. I love the speech. I love the rhetoric. I love the embedded cynicism. I loved how you're trying to, you know, challenge a dominant narrative in the way that you're doing, which is very attractive. And this would have been an amazing speech for a UN assembly or a political assembly. But from the perspective of, of an academic, I felt like this should have included more hard data, more evidence for what you were saying because you're basically selling us on a story which we know that is correct you know but we need convincing if this was a, a jury present here an academic jury you would have had the comment that what's your evidence what's your data right? although we know what you're saying is true so my my question is why did you not include data it would have made your speech emotional but also scientifically you know uh, strong and thank you a third question here Thank you for your presentations, because uh, for me, uh, it shifts lenses from, uh, how to say, Mediterranean to Mexican perspective. This is one. And although we have two standpoints, if I say from the standpoint theory, that means Italian, we have another method, method of research, anthropology. And when it comes to anthropology, uh, I'm evoking question, you are under no obligation to answer, but maybe for the future, when, once we see the paper published, I hope, um, statistics and uh, interviews, because when it comes to anthropology, you give us your experience as a person and you show us witnesses and testimonies, unlike reading books and uh, how to say, go, uh, going through information and collecting gathering information from digital sources or uh, hard copies. So this is one point which is very positive and I highly appreciate it when it comes to anthropology, to these questions about um, migration, crossing border lines, politics, uh, etc. Two, the eclectic approach in itself from an academic perspective is how to say complex in terms of the uh, set forth objectives in terms of thematic concerns theoretical concerns and your findings maybe one question could be your findings after presenting this piece of work and what type of impact 
given that when we speak about anthropology and history, there should be something great or uh, of an added value to the field of academia and society. And thank you. Are there any more questions? Yes. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the uh, uh, speakers for this um, very important presentation indeed. Um, I do agree with, let's say, maybe 98% of what you're saying. Just one um, uh, remark that is closely related to what uh, uh, my colleagues, um, Dr. Shwari and um, um, my colleague Osama also raised in relation to the methodological issues in the study. Maybe um, I'm sure that you certainly have used anthropological uh, methods in investigating. Maybe you haven't mentioned them. So would you please uh, elaborate on this and tell us about the methodology uh, that you employed in collecting the data for, uh, for the abstract itself says gathered during several months. So we need to mention the number of months for uh, objectivity reasons and in order to achieve by the norms of writing according to uh, international styles and certainly you know um, uh, in Morocco with sub-Saharan people so we don't know how many you have dealt with maybe so this helps us understand uh, the issue um, would you please comment on the issue of uh, the need for objectivity instead of subjectivity in reporting science or reporting so in social sciences in particular um, considering anthropology, because as you certainly know, um, one of the methods of uh, conducting research in anthropology is using observation techniques, interviews, text analysis, focus groups, etc. So please tell us more about the methodology employed. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Bernardo and Gian Maria, you will have two minutes for each of you uh, to respond and to clarify some points. Two minutes for each of you. Two minutes for all of them. I'm so sorry. <laughs> all right, thank you you're, for. You're not lucky. I'm the the the, the worst uh, chair. Oh, that's all right. Women you can ever have in your life. Uh, we built part of I'm our so career sorry. in Denmark, and they're very strict with times, so we completely understand that. <laughs> so thanks everyone for these important questions, and uh, I'm glad that many of the questions are related. So I hope I can we can try to give a brief overview of uh, why this emphasis, why this approach, at least in the presentation. Uh, I said at the beginning that this is Italy and this kind of migration is not our main field of study. Uh, we've been researching mainly in Mexico, Morocco and Turkey. And several months, is, we started in 2014 in Mexico. We've been working for approximately what, a year and a half in shelter for migrants where we were doing activism and humanitarian work. And meanwhile, we were also collecting data through participant observation, interviews, and all the typical methods used in anthropology. In the street with migrants. We also did part of our field work living in the streets with migrants, pretending, let's say, pretending to be migrants and traveling with them through the marginalized routes people uh, you, you use to avoid uh, um, both crime and institutional control. Um, of course, statistics numbers are important. In our uh, PhD thesis, in some of our articles, we include that, but we are more on the qualitative side. Our ev evidence is usually what people tell us, like the, the direct testimony of people that try to uh, make us understand what's the actual impact of uh, migration policies and this connects to the topic of this uh, of this workshop crisis and what janina has been talking about a lot crisis from a governmental perspective a crisis for whom if if we have to give a consideration about it we think the crisis is the crisis lived by migrants mainly because having to deal with all these difficulties in route it's something that deeply affects people's present, but also leave big traumas for the future. And concerning numbers, just to give a very brief example, I mean, uh, the North, the global North talks a lot about migration crisis, and it's what has been researched a lot by academics as well. But if we look at statistics, at numbers by the IOM, uh, the UNHCR, the main agencies that deal with migration issues, we could see that only one third or even less of migrants go from south to north. The majority of migration currently happen from south to south. Most people 
uh, are not refugees, they are IDP, are internally displaced people. They stay in their own countries. So, I mean, it's just maybe very basic information, but it makes us feel that maybe the crisis is not really in the north. Maybe just that's just a discursive framework that's, that is created to justify, to perpetrate a particular kind of politics, while actually those who are living the crisis are migrants on the side, but sometimes also transit countries that have to deal with this big influx of people when sometimes even local population don't have enough to reach the end of the month, unemployment rates are high, and so on and so on. Um, do you want to add something? Or yeah, I, go I think <laughs> I want to add something. Um, uh, well, just one minute, yeah. So, uh, well, about the including the hard data and publications, I mean, like, you know, I mean, like, really, we have been working on this field for like 10 years, you know, already, and we have many publications online, which you can actually look into it if we if you look into our names, you search in Google and then you will find all these publications. We have all this detailed information on all the different methodologies we have used on our different. We have been like doing anthropological work in Turkey, in Morocco, in Mexico, in Spain as well, in Ceuta and working with migration issues for 10 years. So I think when you only got like 15, 20 minutes to do a presentation, I think it's a waste of time to present all this kind of like hard data and everything that you can just find in Google and, and, and easily, like quickly. And, and I think it's better to use the time to go into like important matters. And so like the anthropology, the statistics and and the testimonies, well, yeah, we also talk about including testimonies and like uh, putting the words of people and stuff. And we have been also talking a lot with like um, um, people working in NGOs and lots of uh, activists in, in all these places and as well as in Lampedusa when we went to see Janina. And, and yeah, well, I mean, it's great to include all this, you know, but as I said, like when you have limited time, I think in my personal opinion, I think it's better to like um, use the time to read their, read their, um, well, um, kind of like, you know, use it to, 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 to go into the hot topics and, and, and just, uh, uh, and then, well, publications are for that, you know, and we have many, so you can go and have a look at them and, and yeah, so, um, yeah, the theoretical source and all that. So I, I already said, and yeah, so the theory and methods and, you know, well, uh, how many months we did of field work, I think we have done about maybe 35 to 40 months of field work in all these different places, in Turkey, in Mexico, in Morocco, in Ceuta, uh, in Spain as well. And so, yeah, also, yeah, we have like maybe 40 months of field work or something between 35 and 40, which, um, yeah, which are already written there on the publication. So, so I invite you also to, to have a look at our work and, and, and I hope you really like, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. So singularity is not always concerned by quantitative methods uh, and uh, sometimes one t testimony could, uh, yes. I just want to apologize for not having an answered a few questions that were very relevant about we this challenge. After, uh, yeah, we can catch up in the, the coffee time. Change. Thanks everyone. Thank you. So the third session, um, the most interesting one, one probably, uh, because she, 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 it's a session which will be moderated by my friend, Hakila Selemi Bakluti uh, from the University of Sfax. And the search session will deal with critical uh, reflections on humanities and uh, social science, just the time. Uh, we will have a break or we will just, so we take, we will take a break, um, a short break for those who are, um, uh, who are, um, um, who are present uh, uh, online and we will be back in 10, 10, 15, 10 minutes. So, okay. 4.30, we will be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.